You're listening to Product-Led Revenue, brought to you by Correlated. In each episode, you'll hear first-hand advice and tactics from SaaS, sales and revenue leaders about using product signals to drive expansion and revenue growth. Let's jump in. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Product-Led Revenue. I'm Breezy Beaumont and this episode is brought to you by Correlated, a customer expansion platform for B2B software companies that focus on product-led growth. Today, our guest is Vikas Bambri, Senior Vice President of Sales and Customer Success at Customer. Vikas, thanks for joining me today. Thanks for having me, Breezy. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Awesome. And so to give our audience some background on yourself, can you tell us a little bit about your role at Customer? Sure. So just a quick bit of context as to who Customer is before I talk about myself. So Customer is a b2b SaaS platform it's a crm for customer service empowering some of the world's greatest brands to engage and deliver exceptional customer experiences to their customers um, both um, from an agent perspective as well as through powerful automations so my responsibility here at customer where i've been for four and a half going on five years is the head of sales which i think most people know what that is and of course, customer experience, which includes our professional services group, customer success, and global support. Awesome, and you got into a little bit there, but just for anyone listening who maybe didn't know about customer, they, they got your brief intro, but can you just talk a little bit about the problem that you're hoping to solve at customer? Sure, the problem that we're trying to solve is that most brands, even today, after all the money they've spent on people, process, and technology simply don't know who their customers are when they reach out to them with a customer service inquiry. So that could be, you know, retailers where people are reaching out and saying, where's my order? It could be delivery apps where people are saying that, you know, my order was, you know, received, but it wasn't the right order. It could be fintech companies where people are saying, you know, my balance is incorrect. So all of those types of things are still a challenge. And what happens when we reach out to these brands is they still don't have an awareness of who we are. We've all dealt with it, where the, the customer agent asks you a dozen questions before, you know, you have to give them like your, you know, name, serial number, et cetera, before you get any detail, if at all. And so they don't have the full context of who you are, what your relationship is with that brand. And so they're not able to deliver an optimal customer experience. And in this day and age, most customers actually want to self-serve and figure out the solutions to these problems themselves. Once again, without having the context of who the customer is, it's very hard to even assist them through automations for them to support themselves. And it's a, clearly an important enough problem to be solving that uh, customer is actually in the process of being acquired by Facebook, uh, now known as Meta. I know, and I'm sure you can't talk about any specifics about that acquisition, but it's got to be a, an exciting time internally. I'm just curious to hear your your feedback and feeling on it with that that occurring. Look, I think the the any time that you are in the process of being acquired, obviously pending regulatory approval, and that's pretty well stated. Um, it's um, a you know it's you know a testament to all the hard work that went in through you know both our founding team as well of course as all the crew members that have joined us along the way. So it's certainly exciting, and you know we'll still wait to see what the regulator what the regulators come out with, and how we end uh, up uh, resolving and and perhaps being part of Meta. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So you've been at the customer, you've been a customer now for about five years or so, and you guys have grown quite a bit. You have over 350 employees I was seeing on LinkedIn. So can you talk a bit about what it was like when you first joined and, and sort of what that journey has been to what it is today? Oh, wow. If I can remember that far uh, back, you uh, know, so when I, when I first joined, you know, as the first uh, VP of sales, we were primarily an engineering company. Wow. I think at that time we were 30 some odd employees and the vast majority of them were in engineering. We had a handful of folks in marketing uh, and a couple of sales and business development people. So, you know, we were still in the process of figuring out what our go to market motion was going to be. Uh, the, uh, the company co had launched, the product had launched, but now there was an opportunity to really you know, engage the prospect base, the customer base, and start building out our entire go-to-market motion. 
Got it. And and the team that you manage today, um, what does that look like as SVP of, of, of sales and CS so, and customer experience, I guess I should say, what does your team structure look like today? So today, you know, when I look at sales and, and customer experience, um, um, first of all, sales is our account executives. Uh, we um, have them segmented um, um, in terms of our go to market strategy. We have two segments. We service uh, early uh, stage, high growth companies. We call that our commercial segment. And then we have what we call our enterprise, which is more mature companies, been around a while um, and um, are maybe on their first or second customer service platform and now looking to modernize to, you know, either because of scale or because they want to deliver an optimal experience. So those are kind of our two go-to-market motions where we have account executives across the board. We have a channel team. So partnerships are extremely critical uh, to uh, us. And, you know, if, as I said before, the contact center is a mature industry. So there are so many players in it. And for us, it's really critical that we work with, you know, whether it be our telephony providers, workforce optimization, data analytics tools. So all of that is part of the overall solution, particularly the further you go up, you know, towards the enterprise. And so working with these companies is extremely critical. So our channel organization, uh, uh, sales engineering, of course, uh, uh, RevOps and sales enablement. Uh, so as we continue to scale, making sure that we're using best in class tools, best in class data, and enabling our people to, to be successful. Um, and then uh, on the CX side, as I mentioned before, professional services. So those responsible for actually onboarding and implementing our platform for our customers, customer success that make sure they're maximizing the investment that they're making out of our platform. And then of course, our global support team. Awesome. And, and thinking about how you've split up on the sales side, specifically with the commercial team and more enterprise team, it, it starts to dig in on a little bit of a topic I'd like to jump into, obviously, with the, the title of this podcast being product-led revenue. So customer originally, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, launched with a product-led growth model. And then you, in some ways, sort of moved away from that to move up market. Can you, can you talk me through what that looked like, sort of what were, what were the decisions going into, going into that process? Yeah, so, you know, a lot of times, you as a, as a founding team uh, can have a thought process about how the market is going to perceive your product, how you're actually going to operate. And then the market, you know, kind of course corrects you uh, and says, actually, this is, this is how your, your product is being embraced or look, looked at. So um, when we launched in market, you know, it was very much, you know, as you said, kind of a, a PLG motion, kind of, we're going to go out there with a try buy and we're going to start, start with, small customers and then eventually over time like i think a lot of SaaS companies will mature into the enterprise what we found early on was because of the data and automation in our platform and the capabilities which we provided there was almost kind of an embrace by larger companies mid-market enterprise companies to say no 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 hold on this is fundamentally different than the tools and services that we are seeing out there today. In fact, one of our early customers, I think the very interesting story about them, when they looked at us, they'd given up all hope uh, looking um, at the legacy vendors and were in the process of actually thinking about spinning up and developing their own uh, customer uh, service platform, right? So they had you know, kind of given up and said, okay, we're just gonna have to build it ourselves because nobody is really thinking about this problem the same way that we are. and and Lucky for us, somebody introduced them to to us, and and you know uh, we uh, came to partner with them, and now we've partnered with them for four going on five years. So, for me, it was these customers are saying that there's nothing in this segment that does what we do, and the power of what we're able to deliver also requires some real thought process behind it. Because I, in the early days, when you're delivering a horizontal platform, it's not an application. So there's a distinction there it's not cookie cutter as to what the use case is. There's actually thousands of use cases that you can do. And then it, it over time you mature to say, okay, now we're gonna create modules, et cetera. But in the early days, the power of the platform was really something where you needed um, the um, thought process and the horsepower to embrace. 
So that's once again, why we saw where companies had that maturity. They had people there, whether it was technical, whether it was business analysts or people who really knew how to use the platform and then could do some really cool things with it that we could then of course, over time, go back and start to productize and modularize and make it in a way that you can point and click and do things. So we kind of worked our way backwards to, to where we are today. Okay, very cool. So so you launched with this product-led growth model. I'm, I'm guessing you had a, quite a bit of inbound. Then you realize, okay, there's actually a pretty strong use case here in, in either mid-market or, or sounds even more like sheer enterprise play. And so was there a, a move away from the product-led growth model during that 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 time, like the try before you buy model, so that you could focus the product and the features that were coming out more on what the enterprise was requesting? Is that sort of what was driving you to make that shift? Or what was the what was the shift there? No, you're absolutely right. That that was certainly a thought process, which is we've got a you know segment of our icp that where there's a heavy demand there's a gap in the market um and um, we have a real opportunity to you know as as a you know as a newcomer into a mature space where there's literally you know a number of legacy vendors how do you differentiate yourself so it's like okay let's go in and conquer this and then we will go and conquer other components or uh segments us. of the icp so that there was a a concentrated effort, like, let's take advantage of this. Like, we've got a window of opportunity here. Let's go crush it here, create a foothold, and then we'll go look elsewhere and then continue to um, um, mature the product, create more capabilities, and then we'll, you know, start tackling different segments of the market. Very cool. And so fast forward to today, you've tackled a good portion of, of enterprise, mid-market, and now what's the thinking? Is it, are you shifting sort of back down across? So covering kind of like the full market or, or where are you headed now? That's exactly right. Um, you know, I hate to say it, but there, there, you know, there's no stopping us now, right? I, we, we've, been, we've, we've been in market, we've had a tremendous amount of success. Uh, we oh, have a yeah. number of customers and, and now we, we believe we have the capability based on the maturing of our product, just the learnings even. and. You know, when a lot of times when people think about PLG, they often think about just the core product itself. And of course, that is probably 70 to 80 percent of it. But there's all the ancillary things that you need around it. Right. You need the um, what um, we call customer university, which is our platform for people to come in and learn that didn't exist a couple of years ago. Right. We have a global support infrastructure. We have a community forum where customers can ask each other for advice and solutions and get creative. So there's all these different things that you also need to consider beyond just the product to actually make sure it's an optimal, because at the end of the day, the only thing that matters is that the customers are getting what they need out of your platform. Got it. How do you think customer launching with this product-led model, how do you think that shaped the trajectory of the company that I know it's a big question, but I'm, I'm curious from your point of view, you know, that's a lot of companies today are, are maybe more traditionally sales led and thinking about shifting to product led. At the same time, we see huge, including customers, product led growth companies that are hugely successful. Um, but not, not every company took this product led approach from the start. So I'm curious how you feel like that impacted what you what you're able to achieve as a company i don't think there's a one size fits all i, I think it's really easy as, as i said earlier to sit there and pontificate as you're kind of either drawing up what you're trying to do or how you want to approach a market you know most of the time you may be right what you put in your you know initial pitch deck is actually what ends up happening in reality and that that's great Sometimes you have to see what the market's appetite is and then how do you course correct? And, and that's really key because the challenge most people have with that is actually not in the technology again, it's in the leadership. If you've got people that have only been in one model and now all of a sudden you go to market and you're like, oh wait, but the market's actually asking us to do something different. Can your 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 leadership team and your and your your key you know your key stakeholders within your company actually pivot 
And we were fortunate that we, you know, we've all been around the block a little while. Um, we've um, seen different things that work and we were able to really kind of tailor what the market was asking of us back to our product and solution set. So we, we didn't get fixated like this is the only way we can do it because that's all we know. We were actually able to be nimble and flexible. Okay. And let's talk about the breakdown of the various roles on your team. So we talked a little bit about, you know, how you broke it down on a segment basis, but I'm curious sort of what are the numbers on, on the breakdown between sellers, customer success, SDR, BDR team, what's that look like for you all? Sure. So in, in terms today, our, you know, sales organization is, you know, kind of north of 50 and that's probably as of this morning, because it's, it's growing so fast. Um, <laughs> You know, the vast majority of that are account executives. Uh, you know, as I said, you know, within the st strategic uh, the commercial group today, uh, we've uh, got, you know, a team of 16 and then we've got a team of 21 and growing on the enterprise side. Um, we have sales engineers as well that support them. And then that channel organization of six people that are supporting these global channels and alliances. So that kind of encompasses you know, the sales organization from a, from a BDR SDR perspective, we've kind of run at a, you know, you know, we've been anywhere from a one-to-one -to, -one to a two-to-one, depending on kind of where we are in the year, you know, ramp up if we're looking to conquer new markets. So we get pretty creative there in terms of different things we can do. And um, then ultimately on the customer success side, you know, that really, you know, for me, doesn't necessarily have a tie in to, to sales, right? We look at, you know, professional services as, understanding and modeling out what our customer acquisition strategy is, is going to be, what it's forecast to be. And, you know, obviously we have a lot of data that allows us to do that. And then based on understanding how many, you know, implementation managers we need, how many implementation engineers we need, how do we actually forecast you um, know, the, the hiring needs behind that and the growth behind that as, as a team. And in customer success, we look at really based on both the, complexity and size of customer as well as of course their revenue and then building it out into once again different tiers different segments so you know um, we've got our you know commercial customers again where we've got a high touch model uh, uh, sorry uh, a one to many model and then we've got our you know enterprise and strategic where we almost have a, a dedicated model to make sure that they're you know getting the necessary guidance that they need and then from a global support perspective, once again, I think that ties back to your customer acquisition is how many uh, customers uh, are we going to add every quarter? How many inquiries does each customer roughly add? And then how many people do I need? So I hate to say it's that scientific because there's definitely a bit of art involved, but all of this is key for us to model out, to understand, you know, how are we going to grow this team? And then of course, always looking to ourselves as leaders as to how do we continue to optimize? How do we use, how do we ourselves use technology and process to continue to optimize uh, our business as well? So with this inbound and outbound split then, what does that look like for you all? What, what percentages are of people are coming inbound versus outbound? I would say today, 40% of our business comes in inbound and 60% is outbound. Uh -huh. Because I think the unique thing about our business, uh, perhaps, is that this is not a new space, right? The contact center has existed, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. probably since uh, it, it at scale since the early 70s, early to mid 70s. So there's a lot of technology that's out there. Uh, today, uh, today, whether it's the old on-premise vendors, um, the, um, the SaaS 1.0 vendors. And so there's a lot of things that people are out there using. So it really is incumbent on us as a disruptor in the space to knock on the door and not only you know talk about customer, but basically evangelize that there is a new way of treating your customer. Because I think so many people... As I said, if you even look at it from a consumer perspective, and we do a lot of consumer surveys, probably about three to four times a year, and there's almost a defeatist attitude by customers that, look, customer service is bad, it's always going to be bad, and we don't see any, any improvement in the horizon, right? And that's amazing because 
We've added more channels, right? And back in the day, we could only call somebody. Now we can call chat, SMS, et cetera. Um, there's um, more data that more than ever, there's more data. And yet customers continue and there's more training in the, in the contact center. There's more thought going into the wellness of agents, yet customers continue to say the service is getting worse and worse. So something is not working, right? And I think, once again, as a disruptive space, it's important for us to knock on the door and say, hey, there is a different way to do things and you don't have to sit there with the status quo. Yeah, it doesn't have to be a bad experience. <laughs> it, it really doesn't. And we've all been there, you know, which is the amazing thing. Yeah, definitely. I actually, I previously worked in the call center space for a bit on, on a, a voice technology platform. So I got to uh, see firsthand some of the problems that you're talking about. So, I mean, even as a consumer, though, we've, we've all seen it and felt it, you know, either a positive experience I, with some companies and others, you know, not so much. But <laughs> I, I always joke, yeah, you know, um, for those of us who've been in this industry, and I, I've been it over 20 years is to be in situations where you listen to, you know, you call into a contact center. And I don't know how many times we hear, I'm so sorry, Mr. Bambury, but our systems are running slow today. What that agent is trying to do is the system may be running slow because they're running on, you know, these old legacy systems, but reality is they're trying to buy time because they literally have to navigate. If you've walked on the floor of a contact center, even today, they usually have two monitors. And on those two monitors, if they're lucky, some even have three, they have multiple tabs and applications open. So you call in, yes, it might screen pop to this little application over here, but they've got to go to five different applications to figure out who you are, where your order is, and what you're calling about. Then they go back and try to resolve your issue. So they're just trying to buy time. So a lot of these things, it's really funny when you talk to a layperson who's not, you know, in the know on the industry and you talk about some of these, they're like, that happens to me all the time is people are saying their systems are slow or they don't have that information or can I transfer you? And so all of this is really rooted in, look, it's really, there's a lot of data about customers and everybody wants to deliver this amazing Zappos-like experience, but it's really hard to do. And, and so that uh, creates an opportunity for a company like us. Awesome. So you have the, we have the commercial team, you have the enterprise team and, and thinking about, you know, what is a focus for you all? Are you focused on expansion? How much are you thinking about the land and expand model versus just landing today? What's that look like for you? No, I think that's, uh, you know, that's kind of a, a natural motion for us because I think there's so much opportunity to continue to optimize that customer journey and customer experience. So um, um, what we have done is when, when we came into the industry, we realized that there was a lot of frustration with the legacy vendors. The term we heard over and over in our due diligence was, look, so-and-so just nickel and dimes us, right? Every time we turn around and we want you know, something else, or we want to improve, or we want to optimize, there's another fee. So we were very thoughtful about keeping it simple and transparent. So when we launched in market, we came out with two flavors of our product, um, you um, know, very clearly priced, priced per agent and said, look, this is what it is. These are all the features that you get. And, you know, other than one or two ancillary add-ons, there's nothing there. So we're not going to come to you with 50 SKUs and try to create this, you know, matrix every quarter and figure that out. So very clear about that. So for us, there's two things. We're a seat based model. So there's a natural expansion that happens within a company uh, as they grow. So as they continue to grow and if they're doing well and they continue to add customers now, optimally, not at the rate that they're adding customers, are they adding seats in their contact center? That defeats the purpose. But you know, look, if I add a million customers, they are going to have, unfortunately, they're going to have issues and they're going to have inquiries. And so we're going to need people to support them. So that's something that our customer success team really manages is to make sure the team is getting, you know, the customer is getting full value out of our platform. And then if natural expansion happens to happen, then that's great. The opportunity for us over time is we continue to innovate and add on additional features. 
outside of that core set, um, um, whether it be net new areas of the business that we can help a customer tackle, whether it's automation tools or automation packages to actually help them optimize, not having to go out and hire more people. Those are things that we're always looking at. And then we, we leverage the, uh, the sales team, the account executive team to go back, work with their customers where they have the relationships and partnership with the customer success team, and then present, display the full value of these additional offerings. Got it. So it sounds like a focus on the expansion side then is not just a, a general seats expansion within an account, but also on the, the cross sell piece into these, these other multiple product lines. That's correct. You know, but with the, with the key piece being for us, you know, we keep adding new features and components to those existing, you know, suites that I mentioned, you know, kind of the, the all inclusive pricing. So we continue to optimize those. We look at these, you know, additional components as things that not everybody wants to take advantage of. So why should they bear the burden? If this is not something that um, will appeal to the masses, then that's when we say, okay, look, we're going to look at this as a, as an optimized offering that we create a, a cross sell opportunity for. Got it. And can you tell me a little bit about how your team is determining when it's a good time for for an expansion opportunity. So is there certain data that they're looking into? Are they collaborating, you know, with with the CS and, and the sales team having frequent meetings? How is that going? So we do uh, quarterly business reviews with uh, uh, many of our clients. And one of the things we look at is the data around their performance and usage of the platform. And we look at things like not only just overall usage, but what is the impact of that? Because we have so much data about how their customers are experiencing them as a brand, right? So for example, if we're seeing long hold times in the chat queue, um, if um, we're seeing that you know average handle time is going up with the agents, um, um, they may even share with us, look, you know, there's uh, this, you uh, know, across the globe, there are challenges in hiring right now for whatever reason. We're just not able to staff up. Those are all the conversations and data that we have to then say, we have some solutions that can actually tackle that particular challenge that you're having, right? We have AI chatbots that can actually answer and resolve some of those chats that are coming in. So people don't have to deal with these long hold times. They can actually self-serve and answer the challenge themselves. So once again, that creates then an opportunity to have a conversation about that additional product set. So it's data driven in terms of understanding what our customers are using, how they're using it, with the priority being get them to optimize what they're using today, but then looking for areas of opportunity for us to go in and then position additional products that the customer can take advantage of. Got it. So it's sort of like a, a hybrid between finding the opportunities um, for your, your customers to become better at serving their customers, but also opportunities for maybe for them to maybe use additional pieces of your platform or features that they might not be using today, or even just probably greater adoption of the platform as well. So it's really interesting to sort of look at it through both of those lenses. Right. It, it, it starts with, actually for us, it's very unique is it doesn't even start with our customer. Uh, it actually starts with their customers. So one of the things that we we look at is what is your customer journey and what, how are you trying to optimize? And once again, because we've gone with this, you know, suite based approach, there's so much capability within the core platform that 90% of the things that you're trying to do, it's all about how do you take advantage of additional components within the platform, configurations, automations, without ever spending another penny. That is our, you know, and that's how I truly believe software as a service should be thought of, right? And, in, 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 you know, we think of it as a service. So how do you optimize that? Because for us, it's not just about, you know, getting that initial sale and getting the customer. We want this customer to be a customer for life, right? And, and be with us for a long time. So if they continue to get the value out of it, then they're not going to want to switch when their contract comes up. Ideally, you want them to renew. So that's kind of how we think about it making sure they're continuing to optimize. And then yes, if they're trying to do something, you know, as I said before, that is, you know, as we look at this journey, 
that is completely unique, then it's like, oh, wow, we have other things that you can, you know, bolt on that may even give you a, a better experience to your end customers. Very cool. And I wanted to dive a bit into pricing. You started talking about it a, a little bit and, and I, the core of it being that you wanted to be able to provide this transparency in pricing that was previously that, that was almost one of your disruptors into the market was that you're being transparent about pricing so you mentioned you have your seats based pricing and that's an all-inclusive piece do you also have a usage-based component of the of your pricing model so once again very important to to listen to the market uh, and this is a great example here so when we launched our AI chatbot offering, um, we were, we wanted to, to stay with the model that, you know, we had, we, you know, we, you know, we had gotten such positive feedback on our core licensing model, seat based, predictable, transparent, et cetera. So we're like, okay, we're just going to follow that. Even though a lot of the historic um, um, AI vendors were doing usage based pricing and we thought, Hey, this is going to be great because you're going to know exactly what you're spending. You're going to know, we're going to give you unlimited usage and you know, it's going to be really great. And this is another way for us to disrupt this market. And it was a real challenge for customers to get their head around. They were so used to the usage based model um, that um, there was resistance. So ultimately, once again, we listened, we pivoted, and we went to a usage based model for that particular solution. So, even though our core licensing is seat based, predictable, and that's what mo most people are comfortable with and want, um, we um, also in our AI offerings, it's a usage based model because that's once again how the market has been um, um, used to consuming it for so long. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, I think that makes a ton of sense. It's smart for you all to be able to to make those pivots I'll, along I'll, the way. I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll tell you, I'll tell you a funny thing, uh, Breezy, and you'll appreciate this. One of our main competitors, when we launched in market, their uh, company, I won't name them. They've been around for, you know, uh, over 12 uh, years and they were one of these, uh, uh, these perpetrators of this a la carte pricing model, the nickel and diming that we heard so much about. Um, after uh, we launched in market and obviously as they started to lose customers to customer with a K and started to see that, and they were probably asking some folks like, what's going on, they went back and actually redid their pricing model to a suite based approach. So once again, it's, it's amazing for us as disruptors, you know, always getting people trying to copy and, and kind of catch up on the technology front. But this was a really interesting one where we actually got a company that was so used to doing something a certain way. You know, I mean, they were going to the street and literally talking about, you know, individual SKUs and how they were performing to pivot to a sweep based approach. And so that was kind of a feather in our cap that, oh, wow, we must really be a disruptor if now we've got an incumbent legacy player who's now trying to, to copy and embrace the sweep based approach. <laughs> you must've done something right. <laughs> it's a good uh, validation there. Absolutely. Uh, what is the saying? Uh, uh, imitation is the greatest form of flattery. <laughs> Um, yes, we, we've seen a, we've seen a lot of that over the last four years. <laughs> we talked a bit about what your team is doing today to look into the product usage for your customers and understand where there might be an opportunity for expansion. If you were to think forward, you know, as as you look to maybe move down market again and really just across the whole market, I guess I should say it's not moving down, but additionally adding on a little bit further down market. What would you you know, sort of if you had to paint a picture of what it would look like in, in an ideal way for your, you know, maybe SMB and commercial team to be able to have this product usage and have these expansion opportunities at on hand a little bit more, I guess, what would be the ideal state of having that data available for your team? Yeah, I think so, so much of the data exist today in terms of you know what customers are doing with the product um, what um, channels they've set up how they've set up their teams uh, what um, automations they're building uh, what um, messaging they're building to their customers so a lot of that detail is there today i think like most organizations it sits in the hands of our product and engineering team and you know being being able to see that and mm -hmm. 
and have um, visibility into that. So I think it's really about unlocking some of those key components, um, not uh, down to the data layer, but to the usage layer, uh, so uh, that our so that our customer success people can offer the best advice. So if they truly know that, you no, know, if we know for as an example that you know the normal you know, 50 seat retail contact center builds, you know, a hundred automations. And now we have one customer that's gone and built 800. They're either doing something really, really cool and unique or something went wrong and, and they've gone off the reservation and maybe they're trying to do something with the platform it wasn't never, never intended for, right? So once again, how do we give them visibility into into things like that? And then on the on the sales side, especially as we continue to mature as a company, continue to offer more and more innovative services and products, how do we look for those opportunities? So how do we understand that, you know, somebody is engaging as an example. Today, we look at customer service and we're doing, you know, inbound SMS as a channel, right? As a support channel. If we know that somebody's using that and over time, we develop an offering where somebody can actually market via SMS. Well, great. If you're using it for service, the theory would be that you would also use it for outbound for customer uh, for, uh, for mar customer marketing as well. So if we created that offering, we don't have it today, so nobody call us for it. But if we had it, then that would be an example of where we would use the data uh, to be able to do some really cool things and make sure that we're addressing the full needs of our customer base. I think that makes a ton of sense. Honestly, it's in line with a lot of the the teams I talk to on a daily basis. And and hopefully, you know, as as our team over at Correlated, we can help to unlock some of that for for maybe customer in the future or just for for other teams in general. I think it's it's a big game changer for sales and customer success teams to be able to not only have these insights, but know how to act on them and when to act on them so that you can add the value piece, which I think is the most important part. It's about having that relevant value add conversation. So before we- I had a, I had a conversation. Oh, go ahead, yeah. Brizzy, just, oh, sorry to speak over you. Just touching on that point, I, I think you, you make a great point because I, I, I sat down with a CEO of one of our customers this morning. Um, and uh, it was our first kind of formal conversation after they had actually launched on our platform. And the one thing he said to me is, my ask of you is every time, you know, either we get together or our teams get together and their QBRs, et cetera, it has to be data driven, right? And, and that's coming from our client. And so that to me is just, you know, speaks to me that we as a sales and CX organization need to get in the weeds of how our clients are using our product, what they're doing with their customer base, the more we can bring to them, then we're thought of as not a vendor, but a true partner. And when you pivot over as a B2B SaaS company for being considered just another vendor to a partner, that's when you become an integral part of that company's ecosystem. And then when you get to that renewal conversation, it should go much smoother than, you know, obviously the Hey, you're you're my vendor. Can you knock the price down by twenty percent? And you know, et cetera. So yeah. that's what we're aiming for as an organization. Awesome. I mean, I think that that's that's the end goal. I, I think that's a great thing to be striving for. So, before we wrap up here, I wanted to ask you, what piece of advice would you give? to product-led companies that are just getting started or to just really any SaaS company in general as they're starting out in their journey, what's one piece of advice that that sort of sticks with you and from your adventures at customer and, and maybe previous to that as well? You've heard me refer to it a couple of times in this conversation, which is listen to your customers. The, the market will tell you what you need to know. I, I think that you know, obviously we have a lot of smart people that sit within our company, whether it be the founders, whether it be the board, you know, lead, other leaders, uh, our wow. engineers, et cetera. But the customers will tell you what you need to do. And, and you've heard it, everything from the feature function set that you need to develop, but even how you price, how you message, how you go to market can largely be driven by 
your customers and what they're seeing and, and the impact that they're looking for you to have as a new player in the market. So that would be my advice uh, to anybody who's, who's doing this. And I think every uh, role should make sure, I think a lot of times we get into this uh, echo chamber within companies, especially in the early days, because we're all so busy, which is the responsibility of the uh, customer uh, sits with customer success. And I think that one thing that we did here at, at Customer very thoughtfully is whether it be our CEO, whether it be our head of product, uh, myself um, in my capacity of owning sales and CX, a number of other leaders constantly engaging uh, our uh, customers to understand what are we doing right? What are we doing wrong? And how can we change uh, to uh, continue to improve? And, and I think that's absolutely critical. Well, it's great ending advice. I think we're coming up on our time here. So where should people go to learn more about you? And where should people learn more about customer? Sure, you can find me on LinkedIn, uh, quick search for Vicus Bambury. And in regards to customer, it's www.customerwithak.com. <laughs> well, Vicus, thanks again. I really appreciate you spending some time with us today. It was great having you on Product Led Revenue. Thanks for having me, Breezy. Thanks for checking out this episode of Product-Led Revenue. This show is brought to you by Correlated, the first platform built for product-led revenue. If you enjoyed what you learned in this episode, make sure to follow the Product-Led Revenue podcast wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts or visit getcorrelated.com slash podcast to get access to all of the latest episodes.